over and over and over again is that there are three common factors that are present in most cases of adultery. Uh, the first common factor is unrealistic expectations. The second is unhealthy conflict management. And the third is unrealized emotional attachments. And those are all kind of clinical terms, but I'm going to break those down slowly and we're going to talk about these because uh, we might initially think these don't affect our marriages, but they might be things that are creeping in that we don't even realize are there. So the first danger sign, this is the first thing you need to be watching out for in a marriage, is unrealistic expectations. This is a particularly dangerous one because this one can affect a marriage right from the get-go. Uh, one of the major factors in problem marriages is when the husband or wife learns that their spouse cannot meet all of their emotional or physical needs. Or when they learn that their spouse may need more from them than they had originally thought they would. They think they, make a mis they think they made a mistake when this happens. And if you ever reach a point in your marriage where you regret your vow, you know you're in trouble. You know this is a bad place to be. In the book of Genesis, we see God's model for husbands and wives. Genesis 2.18 reads this way. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. God saw that the man, uh, I'm sorry, uh, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. Okay. So God saw that the man he created would be better off if he had a helper, someone who was his helper in equal measure. In the Hebrew, the word for helper is the word ezer, which literally means one who helps. Uh, husbands and wives were not meant to fulfill our every desire. Uh, they're not made to make us complete people because that would imply that when God made us, we weren't already complete, that God made us broken and lacking. Uh, the best husbands and wives are the ones who find their value and their worth and their completeness not in their spouse but in Christ. No matter how much you love your husband and wife, or wife, you have to admit that they are a sinner, just like you. They are probably just as broken, just as needy, just as self-centered, just as thick-headed as we are. Uh, if you work as a team and help one another, you're going to find success. But if you expect the other person to be some sort of savior or some sort of redeemer, you're going to be disappointed because that's not who they are. That's who Jesus is. And even at our best, we can only hope to be a poor reflection of him. So often one of the things that causes fights and conflicts in marriages is unspoken or unrealistic expectations. We look at our spouses and we think that they should know what to say or know what to do in any given situation. And when they don't live up to that, we begin to think that there's something wrong with them. And we might start wondering if maybe they don't care about us. And then we might wonder if maybe someone out there was the right person for me all along, and maybe I got the wrong person. And without realizing it, maybe we begin to withhold or neglect our duties to them. And you see how this bad expectations, unrealistic expectations, creates this downward spiral that can lead you into a dangerous, dangerous place. So unrealistic expectations are the first danger sign in a marriage. A second danger sign that we see over and over again is unhealthy conflict management. And when we talk about conflict management, um, that's a clinical term, but a lot of people think it's fighting. They think it's people who are shouting at one another, people who are punching holes in walls, or people who are crying and going to their mothers for the weekend because they can't handle this anymore. You can have unhealthy conflict management and not have anything like that. In fact, two of the most common forms of bad conflict management are intimacy avoidance and conflict avoidance. I'm going to explain those terms. Intimacy avoidance is when one or both spouses keeps the other at an emotional distance in order to avoid being vulnerable. It's when you stop opening up. It's when you start shutting down. 
It's when you get quiet. It's when you try and keep them on the other side of the house. You try and find ways to stay away from them. When you're together, you keep the topics very surface level. You don't go deep. And it's because you've learned that if I open up, I might get hurt. And all of a sudden, you're not, you're not two being one. You're two people that are inhabiting the same space. And on some level, you're not connecting to each other. That's intimacy avoidance. The second one is conflict avoidance. And that's where one or both spouses uh, refuses to discuss disappointments. They refuse to discuss unhappiness. They refuse to discuss problems in the marriage because they don't want to be the cause of a problem or they don't want to start a fight. They're not happy. Something is wrong. Something needs to change, but it's not worth the pain of bringing it up, so I'm going to be here and I'm just going to be unhappy. If either of these patterns becomes common in a marriage, statistics show the chances of adultery or divorce, they go up dramatically. And if you've been married for a while, you probably know the feeling when there's tension in the house, but no one's saying anything. I compare it to uh, those old cowboy movies where you see there's going to be a gunfight and everyone in the town knows it, so the town grows eerily quiet. Everyone goes inside. And you see the two gunslingers and they walk out into the middle of the road and they see one another and they stare each other down and you see the tumbleweed go and there's that whistling sound of the wind and you're just waiting for the first one to draw and fire and then you know it's going to be a huge shootout. Uh, that's how our marriages can feel sometimes if we don't manage our conflicts well. You know, we often make this mistake of thinking that if we're not fighting, we're okay. But that's not really the case. Brother Brian pointed this out in an earlier sermon. He did a great job of pointing this out, that conflicts happen in any marriage. And it's better to actually get problems out in the open and find a healthy way to discuss them and move forward together towards a solution than to keep conflicts buried under the surface. Uh, we like to think that if we're not fighting, we're all good. I'm bad about falling into that myself. Uh, when in truth, the Bible does not call us to bury our problems, but to tackle things head on in healthy and God-honoring ways. A good verse for this is Ephesians 4.15, which reads this, this way. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ Jesus. The writer of Ephesians calls us to speak truth in love. Speaking truth means being honest and open and talking about what you're feeling, talking about what you're experiencing, but doing so in a way that respects the other person and seeks their best interest. That's very hard to do. But if we do that, we're going to see so much growth and so much uh, intimacy in our relationships. If we try to make the other person feel bad because they made us feel bad, we're not communicating. We're attacking one another. We might think we're communicating, but we're not. If you're hoping that your words sting or they hurt, then you're not actually having healthy communication. That's a problem. Likewise, if you're holding back what you really need to say, what really needs to be discussed in a marriage, you're not communicating. You're suffering in silence. Uh, sometimes people uh, bring up marital problems and it just throws the other spouse like for a loop. Like, I didn't even know you were feeling that. I didn't know you were experiencing that. It's because they thought it was healthier to keep that deep down inside than to let it out. So, unhealthy expectations is dangerous. Unhealthy conflict management is dangerous. The third danger we need to be aware of, and this is a big one, unrealized emotional attachments. Okay. Once again, it's kind of clinical, but I'm going to explain what this is. A third danger sign that comes up over and over in cases of adultery is when we develop an attachment to someone who is not our spouse on a deep emotional level. And this affects both genders, but studies show that men tend to be worse at this. Uh, I think it's because men aren't as in touch with their emotions as women tend to be. But a lot of times we make the assumption that as long as physical lines are not being crossed, then we're being faithful to our spouse. That's not true. 
Obviously, there are physical lines we cannot cross with anyone who is not our spouse, but there are also emotional lines that are just as dangerous. Uh, I once read a pastor's story in one of, one of the books I've read. I tried to find it. I couldn't find it, but it's burned to my memory. Uh, it was a pastor who was talking about one Sunday he was getting ready to preach, and that Sunday morning, he was picking out which tie he was going to wear with his suit. He, went to a, he preached at a suit and tie church. And he found himself, when picking the tie, subconsciously wondering if a certain lady in the church, who was not his wife, would like this tie or the other one. Now that might sound really small, that might even sound ridiculous, but I've known far too many people who have destroyed marriages and ministries over affairs that started with something that small. Now thank God this pastor was wise enough that he immediately began a conversation with his wife. They sought out some help, and they got the help they didn't even realize they needed. More often than not, uh, these um, unrealized emotional attachments, they don't start off as physical attraction. Um, the vast majority of men, according to Scripture and according to our experience, want to feel respected in a marriage relationship. And most women want to be shown love and affection in a marriage relationship. So if a husband does not feel respected at home, but there's a woman at the office who praises him, who compliments him on his work, who says nice things about him, he might begin to form an emotional bond with her without even realizing it's happening. He's not even conscious that this is happening, but it's happening because he is subconsciously seeking something that he's not finding at home. Likewise, if a wife does not feel loved, or admired or appreciated by her husband, she is far more likely to develop an emotional bond with someone who does notice her, who does show her affection, who does appreciate her. Scripture attests to this. Uh, the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom in the Bible. Uh, and one of the ways that the Proverbs was written was this, uh, in this way that was like a, a father speaking to his son who is growing up into a man. And his father is trying to impart wisdom into his son. I'm going to real briefly read two passages that highlight this. Uh, Proverbs 2.16, uh, the father says, Wisdom will rescue you from a forbidden woman, from a wayward woman with her flattering talk. And Proverbs 5.3 says this, Though the lips of the forbidden woman drip honey, her words are smoother than oil. So the author of Proverbs knew what, we were, what I'm trying to say this morning. When people are led astray into adultery, it's not always some seductress or some Don Juan coming in with obvious intent. A lot of times, it's just a man or a woman who know the right words to say to make that person feel good about themselves. They don't feel good at home, but they feel good when they're talking to this person. Now hear me out. If one or more of these danger signs is uh, true in your marriage, that does not mean with absolute certainty that your spouse is having an affair, is going to have an affair. It doesn't mean you're going to have an affair. I'm not saying any of that. But what I am saying is that if these danger signs sound familiar, then there are definitely issues that need to be addressed. It's astounding, it's shocking how many people commit adultery and then say, I didn't mean for this to happen. You know, if you're on the outside of that, you think, how do you accidentally cheat on your wife? How do you accidentally cheat on your husband? What do you mean you didn't mean for this to happen? What they mean is that they didn't start down this path with the goal of cheating on their spouse. They didn't leave the house one day deciding they're going to destroy their marriage. But the truth is that sin is never satisfied. And sin always takes you further than you ever plan to go, if you let it. And sin will destroy everything you hold precious, if you let it. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about how do we address these problems, because so far all I've done is point out problems that people have in relationships. Uh, let's do something proactive. How can we guard our marriages? How can we protect our marriages? I think the best way to safeguard a healthy Christian marriage is to periodically go in for a checkup. Periodically go in 
and check in on how your marriage is doing and do so intentionally. You know, when it comes to doctors, I think there's really three people and how they respond to doctors and hospitals. Uh, there's one type of person who does exactly what the doctor says. This is the type of person who goes in for their regular checkup, even if they don't feel bad. They're going to go because it's time for a checkup. The doctor will test their reflexes and do all the poking and prodding. And if there's something wrong, the doctor will say, you need to work on this or we need to do this. If there's nothing wrong, he gives them a clean bill of health and sends them on their way. The second type of person will go to the doctor, but only when they feel sick. You know, I'm aching, I'm sore, I have a horrible headache, you know, something's wrong with me. I'm not functioning normally, so I might not go in for the checkup, but I'm going to go in because clearly something is wrong. And hopefully the doctor can prescribe me something or recommend something to make this sickness go away. And the third type of person is the person who will only go to a hospital if it is a life or death emergency. You probably know someone like this. They can be as green as a lime, but they're going to insist that it's just a cold. My wife is pointing at me and saying, you. Yes. I, I like to think I'm a number two, but I'm probably between two and three somewhere. Yeah, I don't like hospitals. <laughs> I don't like doctors. Uh, I'm from the attitude and school of thought that says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, here's the problem with that. I don't know if it's broke. I'm not a doctor. I really should go in for checkups every now and then just to make sure things are good. I shouldn't just assume I'm healthy. Uh, but we should do that with our marriages too. You know, we might think everything is fine, but we need to be checking in from time to time just to make sure everything is fine. Uh, Lamentations 340 says, Let us examine and probe our ways and turn back to the Lord. I love that because it uses the word probe, which is one of the reasons I don't like going to the doctors. I don't like being poked. I don't like being prodded. I don't like anyone in my personal space. It bothers me. And doctors get way in your personal space. They have to. You know, I wish there was a magic box I could go through and it just says healthy, but that's not how it works. You know, you have to get up close. You have to poke. You have to prod. You have to test some things. So how do we check in? How do we know? What, what sort of test do we give to our marriage? Use the word of God. Use God's standards, because God says a lot about love. He says a lot about marriage. You can take what the Bible says, and you can apply that and see if your marriage holds up to it. A really good passage for this is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's often called the love chapter. And this chapter was not actually written with couples in mind. Uh, this applies to every loving relationship. You can apply it to the church, you can apply it to a family, you can apply it to any relationship, but it works very well for the marriage context because it describes in detail what love is and what love isn't. And anyone could go through this, uh, this chapter on their own or with their spouse and they could test themselves and their relationship along these lines. You know, the first thing it says is love is patient. So. How patient have I been with you recently? Have I been impatient with you recently? It says love is kind. Do you feel like I've been kind? It says that love is honest. Have I been honest with you? Love protects. Have I actually done anything to protect our marriage? Or am I putting our marriage in unnecessary risk? Uh, have I been trustworthy? Have I proved myself to be trustworthy? Uh, it says that love always hopes. Am I optimistic about our relationship or do I act like it's already over? Am I pessimistic? Do I assume the worst about you? Uh, am I persevering or do I talk about giving up or do I quit? Do I put in the work that needs to happen? These are all things that that chapter says that love is, that we can use to start a conversation. There's also a lot of love is nots. It says that love is not envious. So have I come across as envious? to you. Love is not arrogant or proud. Uh, love does not dishonor. You know, have I made you feel ashamed recently in our relationship? Have I put my needs above yours? That's a tough one. Have I been exceedingly angry towards you? Not just frustrated, but have I, have I been exceedingly angry? Do I ever bring up the past to hurt you? The chapter is clear that love keeps no record of wrongs. Do I do that? 
Do I bring up something you did last week, something you did last month, something you did a year ago? Do I keep bringing that up as a weapon? Have I delighted in anything that is not good for our marriage? If you really take the time to think about that one, that one will open up some discussion. Now, if you'll both will talk through a passage like this and respectfully do so, I guarantee you you're going to learn something about yourself that you didn't know. Just like a medical checkup, this won't be the most fun thing you ever do. Uh, you might feel poked, you might feel prodded, it might make you feel uncomfortable, but remember you're doing this to make your marriage healthier. You know, just like you go in for the checkup to work on your physical health, you need to do a marriage checkup to check on your marriage health. A good passage to remember if you do this with your husband, if you do this with your wife, is Hebrews 12, 14 through 15, which says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. I especially love that last part. When we talk through this, when we check in our marriage, we have to talk without being accusing, without being blaming. Uh, remember, we need to strive to kill whatever bitterness comes up with grace. And to do that, it's going to take some work. It's going to take some effort. I think one of the things we have to learn as a couple is how to apologize. We think we know how to apologize, but a lot of times we don't. Um, I'll tell you what's not an apology. We, we mistake this for an apology. I'm guilty of it. We mistake this for an apology. This is not an apology. I'm sorry I couldn't help it. It's not an apology. You made an excuse to justify what you did. How about this one? I'm sorry the kids made me stressed out. Or, I'm sorry work got me stressed out. It's not an apology. You just pass the blame on to someone. Uh, here's an apology. An apology is when you accept responsibility. I'm sorry. That was my fault. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. That's a real apology. A real apology asks for forgiveness. I promise. I'm going to try to do better. Will you forgive me? Okay? That's an apology. When we cross the line, we do something wrong, let's not be so quick to defend ourselves. Let's admit that we did wrong. Everyone has a reason for why they sin. It doesn't make it not a sin. Acknowledge your fault. Apologize and ask for forgiveness. Now, if you do this, you're going to need to ask, you're going to need to apologize, but you're also going to need to forgive because your spouse, if they're doing their part, is going to have something that they're going to need to apologize for. If you say, I forgive you, but you hold on to bitterness in your heart over this, you have not forgiven. You have only said the words, I forgive you. Now realize, forgiveness is not saying that what that person did or said was okay. Forgiveness is giving up on getting even so that you can both move on and have a better future. Realize that forgiveness does not let your spouse off the hook. They still have to settle things with God on their own. We should encourage them and we should actually be praying for them that God will work on their hearts to heal them from whatever caused them to act out in that way. And we need to realize that Anything that God asks us to forgive our husband or our wife for, he has forgiven you for so much more than that. He's not asking you to forgive more than he has forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32 says this, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. So, not a fun exercise so far, but... If done with the right attitude, I guarantee you that the little discomforts you feel now, the awkwardness you feel now, the frustration you're going to feel now is going to pay off in the future. It's going to save you pain and heartache in the future, and it might even save your marriage. But you can't just assume everything is fine. You have to check in. So, so far the sermon has all been about what are the danger signs? You know, how do we know our marriage is in trouble even if we don't realize it's in trouble. And then we've talked about what can we do to help it? How do we check in? How do we make sure 
things are good. Uh, for the rest of the sermon, I'm going to talk about something that I spent a lot of time on and that I wrestled with a lot how to address this, and that's um, how to live in the fallout, because I don't feel like it would be right to just end the sermon and assume everything is good, because I know there are people in here that have been affected by this, uh, just statistically. Um, I know statistically someone in this room has probably been on both sides or either side of the adultery issue. We know someone's been affected. We have a family member, a close friend. It wouldn't be right to end this message and not talk about how do we live in the fallout. When this happens, if this happens, what do we do? Um, so I hope and pray that you're never the victim or the perpetrator of this sin. I hope and pray that you never wake up in the fallout of this. I hope you never have to uh, go through life having to rethink your relationships. I hope this never gets its claws into your marriage. I hope, I hope you are happy, and I hope that you love your husband and your wife till death do you part, and that you just never have to wrestle with this. Um, but I just know that's not always the case. So first, I feel like it's important that we address uh, the victim. Because uh, there's always a victim in adultery. Um, this is the one who has had their world shattered by sin, uh, by the sin of the one they at one point loved more than any, anyone else. Um, to the victim of adultery, God sees and knows your pain. Okay? That's what you say to the victim, because that's what God's Word says. It, it might be shocking for many of us, but... One of the ways that God relates to us, to his people, is as the jilted lover, as the husband of the unfaithful wife. If you ever read Jeremiah, or if you ever read Hosea, or a lot of the Old Testament books, they, they come back to this as one of their primary themes. We see this pop up again and again in the scriptures. When God describes the pain that he feels when his people reject him, the image he chooses is that of a husband who has been again and again betrayed by his unfaithful wife. So, I don't profess to know the pain or the anger or the heartbreak that comes from being betrayed by the person you love most. I can't speak personally into that, but God can. And God does. And the crazy thing is that God loves his unfaithful bride. Uh, so when you pray, know going in, you pray to someone who understands. No one in your life might understand what you're going through, but God does. On a deep and intimate level, God knows exactly what you're going through. And while I can't promise that uh, everything can go back to the way it was, because I can't, I can promise that God knows where he is taking us. And I can promise that when all is said and done, we're going to be with the Father. And we're going to be in a world where there's no more pain and heartbreak and tears. Um, and your spouse may not have been faithful to you, but your heavenly Father is. And what was broken can be healed and will be healed. It may not be today and it may not be tomorrow, but one day it will. God has spoken. God keeps his promises. So we can rest in that. But what if you're not the victim? Um, because, like I said, there's always two sides to this sin. What if you're not the victim? What if you're the one who broke the vow? Believe it or not, God's word also speaks to you, to the adulterer. God restores the repentant. John chapter 8 uh, is a great chapter for this. It's, uh, we see Jesus teaching in the temple. Uh, when a woman is caught in the act of adultery, and she is dragged before him. Uh, the law demanded death for adultery. And the religious leaders wanted to see if Jesus would actually carry out what the law demanded for this sin. 
Now, I've heard so many uh, sermons on John chapter 8, and I've seen and heard a lot of people that try to paint this woman in a positive or a sympathetic light. So they'll say things like, uh, where's the man she committed adultery with? Why wasn't he also brought before Jesus? Uh, they'll say, obviously, this is a trap that was set by the religious leaders. They're just trying to put Jesus in a difficult situation. And there might be something to that. But I really wish people would stop painting this woman as someone we're meant to feel sorry for because we're not called to sympathize with this woman's plight. Uh, Regardless of the circumstance, this is a woman who broke the most sacred vow that two human beings can enter into. And we don't see it, but there are real people behind the scenes whose lives have been shattered by her decision. Not only that, she has sinned against a holy God, and she does not deserve mercy. She does not. She is a homewrecker. She is guilty. Jesus himself will say as much. In the eyes of God, all of her excuses can't hold water. She's not the hero of this story. She's not the victim of this story. She is the villain of the story. Like Adam and Eve, she defied holy God. She took what was not hers. She defied God, and she left human lives shattered and broken in her wake. And if we don't understand this, we're not going to understand what happens next. We have this adulterer before us. She's guilty. She's condemned. We have stones in hand. What does Jesus say? In John 8, 7, he says this. When they persisted in questioning him, he stood up and he said to them, the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. The one without sin should be the first to throw a stone at her. This mercy is offensive. I don't think we get this. This this is offensive mercy. How can Jesus say that? Do you realize what she did? Do you realize how many people she hurt? She took what was holy and she soiled it. She defied not only her husband, she defied you. You're the son of God. She is acting in defiance of you. She has made a mockery of your gospel. How can you say that? How do you want us to forgive her? The one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. John 8, 9 through 11 says this. When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman. Only he was left with the woman in the center. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you. Said Jesus, go from now on and do not sin anymore. This is mercy and this is grace. His final words to this woman do not let her off the hook. The fact that she walked away from this is nothing short of an act of love that passes all understanding. Jesus did not just spare her life. He expects more than that. Go and sin no more is a call to repentance. It's a command to change. We would be fools if we read this passage and we left thinking that Jesus was passive towards this sin because Jesus is going to bleed for this sin he's going to suffer and he is going to die a sinner's death on a cross cursed by God and cursed by man for this sin he's going to take the guilt and shame upon himself and to the adulterer he does this out of an act of love for you. 
If you've committed this sin, I want you to know that there's mercy at the feet of Jesus. And you need this mercy today because without it, one day you will stand before God and what you face is worse than stones. What happened was evil. And without the mercy of Christ, you are going to be cast into darkness. And heaven will cheer because the bad guy got what they deserved. But there is mercy, and it's here, and it's now. But don't you dare come lightly into this presence. He offers grace, but is not cheap grace. Why did Jesus not condemn the adulterer? It's because he was going to take her place. The promise keeping God is faithful and true. He was going to take it on himself for us. He rose to give you new life. Do not be a fool. Take this. Repent. Change. God wants so much more for you. We need to come to the throne of grace. We need to come broken. And when we come, we find healing. We do not deserve this. But God gives us. I'm going to conclude our message um, with a time of prayer. And during this time, I'm going to ask you to respond to God and respond in your heart and in your mind in whatever way you need to.